Before um, going to the last part, of, which means the second part of the section four, session four, which was um, uh, focused on approaches to past truth and historical records, resonance in the present. Actually, I, I like this, um, I like this uh, form, formulation, approaches to past truth and historical records, resonance in the present, because uh, it reminds me of something that uh, Hamid Dabashi uh, called, uh, uh, talked about yesterday in Walter Benjamin. Walter Benjamin talks about ur the urgence of the past, the urgence of the past, and the urgence of the past, uh, which means that we're not looking at the past for the sake of the past. We're looking at the past because there is urgence in the present. And the way, the way we look at the past is very important. And what do we tr choose to talk about in relation with the past has to do with the urgence of the past and the present. And I think this is maybe one way I choose to uh, present my, our two, uh, my two colleagues, uh, Sylvia Naif, uh, who is from uh, Naif, who is from the University of Geneva. She will be talking about making images without making them, uh, creating a visual memory through scripts, ornaments, and gestures. Uh, actually, she she's been working on Islamic uh, uh, art. Uh, she will go through various aspects uh, uh, in order to uh, tell us something about uh, the uh, general context of contemporary arts. Uh, in relation with different heritage. And uh, Dr. Ismail Nashef from Doha Institute of Graduate Studies, uh, who he will uh, focus on uh, Nazar al um uh, and visualizing, visualizing the history of vision. And uh, uh, once again here, we will go through the lenses of one artist, but not for the sake only of making biography, but also of thinking about what does uh, all this trajectory tells us really in relation with visual arts and different aspects in relation with contemporary arts. So without uh, waiting further, I give the floor to Professor Sylvia Neif. Thank you, Dries, for this uh, introduction, and thank you so much, Hamid, for organizing this wonderful conference and for inviting me. So, um, I'm going to speak in this paper uh, about further evolutions on the use of Islamic art in modern and contemporary art. This paper is an attempt to push further the reflection on references to Islamic art that I had started in my 2003 article published in RES with the title Re-Exploring Islamic Art, Modern and Contemporary Creation in the Arab World and its Relation to its Artistic Past. So this is one of the articles that was much read, as I could see from the statistics. In this article, I analyzed how the forms of what we call Islamic art, as defined, let's say, since the 1910 Munich exhibition Meisterwerke in Muhammadanischer Kunst, that are included in major museum collections around the world, had been used by modernist artists in order to Arabize or Islamicize their works of art. My presentation today will start from some historical remarks and then we explore how contemporary artists deal with Islamic art and practices, including more popular forms of it, that are tied to everyday practices which would be rather found in ethnographic collections. Part of my reflection has been inspired uh, by an exhibition that opened last week in Paris at the Institut des Cultures de l'Islam, ici, uh, which is called l'esprit du geste, the spirit of gesture. And it is this notion of gesture, as well as the notion and of the relation to space that I would like to examine more closely here. 
the curator of the Paris exhibition, uh, Sonia Recazance, sees it as an opportunity to display the work of artists, and I quote, who explore and reinterpret gestures, motives, and materials handed down through the centuries and migrations, end of quote. Her main purpose is to re-evaluate art practices of daily life which were hidden or neglected but are still practiced mostly in the private sphere and often by women. Uh, she says she's a feminist uh, curator. It is also an attempt at perpetuating the memory of such gestures and rituals that the modern lifestyle tends to send into oblivion. It's an homage to these gestures, motives, and practices. The starting point of the exhibition is a statement by Moroccan artist Farid Belkahia, one of the leading artists of the Casablanca School in the 1960s and 70s, and the quote is, our tradition is revolutionary, our tradition is futurist. Belkahia takes issue with the idea that tradition is opposed to modernity as proclaimed by the European avant-garde of the early 20th century. Belkaria had become the director of the Casablanca School of Arts in 1962, and with artists Mohamed Melehi and Mohamed Shaba, and writers Tony Maraini and Bert Flint, expressing themselves in cultural magazines like Maghreb Art, Souffle, and Integral, laid the foundations of modern art in Morocco, far from the Orientalist inspirations of the Bozar teaching that could be found until then. Mohamed Shabbat developed the 3A concept, uh, as he called it, meaning that art, architecture, and arts and crafts were part of one integral concept of art. Arts and crafts, especially those produced by the culturally marginalized Amarzir, were an essential pr uh, priority of this group, which culminated in the 1969 exhibition in the Jamaa al Fna in uh, Marrakesh. This coincides with similar and I would say earlier such experiences in other parts of the Arab world, as most of you would know. After a period of adopting Western art style practice, uh, the reflection on modern art that began in the 1940s and 50s in some places uh, was, on the contrary, indissolubly linked to tradition, to what was also defined as heritage, to wrath. For the artists of the period, which was that of independences, it was a question of re-evaluating the arts of the region, be they pre-Islamic, Islamic, or popular from which the previous generation known as the pioneers had distanced themselves. The artists of the contemporary art group in Cairo who first exhibited in 1946 included pharaonic inspired motives in their work as well as those drawn from popular practices such as tattoos and carpet patterns. In Iraq, it was the Baghdad Group for Modern Art founded in 1951 by Jawad Selim and you see here one of his works, uh, that theorized uh, this uh, kind of artistic practice or what a kind of modern art practice should be in a country like Iraq, giving two main artistic references. One was Yahya Al-Wasiti, a miniaturist of the 13th century, and the other Pablo Picasso, uh, um, Yahya Al-Wasiti being a miniaturist, it was not, the idea was not to make new miniatures, but just to have a kind of, let's say, legitimacy in painting in the country. The uh, uh, purpose was to say we had painting in Iraq. And uh, the other personality was Pablo Picasso because he was the modern painter who had, uh, through the use of uh, let's say what is called primitive Andalusian art, but also of course to African art, uh, who had succeeded in becoming what they th uh, thought was the major, one of the major painters uh, of the modern time. Um, motives inspired from folk art, as you can see here, uh, and you have the patterns of uh, traditional rugs, for instance, um, as tattoos and other uh, motives could be found in these paintings. But, and this is maybe something which is less noticed and which was at that time not really at the center of those reflections. But you see here on the left, I don't think we have yeah, here, you see here on the left of this painting, you see those motives which are clearly inspired by these decorations that you would find on the Abbasid Palace in uh, Samarra, in Iraq. 
similar principles were adopted widely in the Arab region in the second half of the 20th century with the aim of producing modern art in line with international standards but having a strong local connotation through the introduction of those elements. And Horufia, of which we spoke just before, which, is, which uses the letters of the Arabic alphabet to Arabize abstract art, Arabize in uh, quotation marks, and became widespread from the 1970s onwards, is the culmination of these reflections. I would like to begin here with a historical introduction before discussing more recent examples of references to practices of uh, Islamic art. I will start with Madiha Omar, who is considered with her fellow Iraqi Jamil Hamoudi to have been the first to practice what would later be named Hurufiya. Hamoudi uh, is known for having written in 1949, while she was living in Washington, the Manifesto Arabic Calligraphy, an inspiring element in abstract art. Omar wrote that it was not about coming back to, traditional, to the traditional art genre of, callig of Islamic calligraphy, but rather to take inspiration from the letter as a bare form, a form which is deeply tied to Arab culture. For her, calligraphy gives a sensuous pleasure, has melodious values, there is grace and rhythm in it. However, calligraphy, and this she underscores, is not adapted to the present age, and thus it should be liberated from what she calls the filling of geometrical design. However, and in contrast to what some later artists would do, uh, Omar did not rec uh, use recognizable shapes of letters of the Arabic alphabet. Her work was much more about the movement uh, the gesture, she would rather say the rhythm created by the Arabic script. And if you look at, at this quite <laughs> astonishing uh, uh, painting of the 1950s, you will find that this somewhat strange forms which maybe remind Arab letters, but I would say much more the movements of Arab letters, they hide inside, I don't know if you see them, yeah, you see them, uh, some heads, uh, into it. And uh, oh. she also says for Omar it was Im important that each letter for her had a, a strong personality which she wanted to use in her work and maybe this expresses some of her idea of this. Does clearly Omar does not refer to Islamic art in the sense that we uh, generally understand that uh, and that she had studied with Richard Ettinghausen who was one of the uh, major historians of uh, Islamic art. Uh, nor does she practice calligraphy in, in the way it was practiced in previous centuries. She takes over only the spirit of the letters, the, the dynamic movement they inspire, the personality, as she says, that each letter expresses. A similar way, in some way, uh, of referring to calligraphic tradition is to be found in the work of the Tunisian artist Naja Mahdawi, one of the leading exponents of Hurufiya, whose compositions appear at first glance to be visually very close to calligraphy. Born in 1937, Mahdawi first studied at the Carthage Free School, then art theory and philosophy at the Academia Santander in Rome. He lived also in Paris from 1968 to 73. And there he was at the Cité des Arts and at the École du Louvre. In 1969, and this is also an important uh, moment for him, he discovered Japanese graphic arts, thanks to French art critic Michel Tapier. In 1972, he began doing graphic work on parchment, using a material that was used traditionally. A year later, he traveled to Morocco, where he met some of the avant-garde artists of the country, the already mentioned Malehi, Belkahia, Shiba, as well as Dia Azawi, the Iraqi painter who also was then uh, in Morocco. He began to think about how to integrate his culture of origin into his artistic practice. Um, Mahdawi came to Hurufiya after an initial figurative period, albeit already at odds with the Ecole de Tunis, the painting style that was largely dominating in Tunisia and grounded in an orientalist and exotic view of the land and its inhabitants. 
In an interview he gave before he came to Hurufia in May 1966, he said, and I quote, folklore, I have nothing against our heritage which we must cultivate, enrich, and respect. But what does this have to do with painting, question mark, and end of quote. Mahdawi developed an interest generally in human alphabets beyond the Arabic writing. In an article published in the journal Horizon Maghrebin in 1998, he described their characteristic, starting with the most ancient writing systems such as Ugaritic, passing through Chinese, then through the styles of Islamic calligraphy, concluding that Muslim art derives from the theory of the universe. Uh, Indeed, while he specifies that for him, recourse to the sign of the written word is a way of setting oneself, and I quote, apart from the school of the other, meaning the Western other, and to broaden the field of complementarities, the aim is to create a different art, one which would enrich the universal uh, heritage. So this is, again, the same kind of concern that you can find in the Baghdad group of modern art, to be specific in order to be universal. Uh, in another text presented in 1995 in Tokyo, he makes a distinction between the letters, signs, and bits of letter. He also states that he was moving away from the uh, conventional styles of Arabic calligraphy, whose values, he said, and I quote, belonged to another time and another cognitive order, joining here Madiha Umar's opinion. Through the particular, he seeks to reach the universal, as I already said. His collaboration with the German painter Wolfgang Heuwinkel in the beginning of the 90s might be an example of this. But what is more interesting here is in a conversation I had with him several years ago in Tunis, Mahdawi said that it was not the form he was interested in, but the gesture of the calligrapher that he wanted to reproduce. This is also why he did not use existing Arabic letters. You can search for them, but you will not find them. But only shapes that reminded them, because he wanted to reproduce the calligrapher's daily practice, the rhythm and movement of his work, rather than produce meaning in a kind of reenactment of the calligrapher's work, if you allow me to use this expression. Omar, as well as Mahdawi, have thus what we could call a performing conception of the art practice, which they render on their canvases and in sculpted form. Uh, Mahdawi stressed also the importance of handcrafts, especially in the Maghreb, where there were, in his view, no figural representations until the 18th century. This is not correct, but this is what he says. He considered that artists of the third world, and this is his wording, although keeping their universal touch, have to come back to those practices like uh, of traditional uh, production of arts and, art and, ar um, and artifacts, like pottery, ceramics, glassware, tapestry, and so on, uh, in a kind of counter-proposal to easel painting. It is then only consequent that since the 1970s, he would have uh, weavers uh, reproducing his works of art on a tapestry. And these weavers were females. Uh, this is cons consistent with his statement in the manifesto and can be considered as a re-evaluation of inherited practices in Tunisia. And it is also a way, and I found this is the most interesting point for me, of erasing the limit enhanced by the adoption of art in its Western modality between what we could call high art, namely calligraphy, mostly practiced by man, and later on easel painting and sculpture, and folk art, often practiced by women and considered as less valuable. Now, for contemporary artists, collaborating with artisans or highlighting their techniques and skills is often a team. Sarah Ouhaddou, born in France and now living in Morocco, is interested in traditional crafts, especially those of Berber or Amazir women in Morocco. As a child, she used to create toys with the rest of textiles or small pieces of wood she would find in her grandparents' house in Meknes. As an adult, she studied design in France and went back to Morocco to work with her aunts, who were weavers, embroiderers, tailors, and cooks, 
and created her first artworks with them. Uhado produces tapestries, glasswork, which you see here, invented alphabets, also you see here, and pieces inspired by archaeological objects. She aims at giving back to art artis artisanal practices the creative place they had in the country's economy before the French colonial administration transformed them into fixed traditional patterns. Part of her more recent work is made of fragments of glass, Iraqi glass, as it is called in Morocco, used for the building of colored glass windows. This was the case with an installation she did at the Palais de Tokyo in Paris in the exhibition Our World is Burning in 2020, which was called Two Stars, on which the chanted poems of Berber women were transcribed in an attempt to preserve this ancient oral tradition. She used the same technique in the work you see here, which was shown at the exhibition Lettre Ouverte in 2017-18 at the Institut des Cultures de l'Islam, also in Paris. In this year's exhibition, again at the Institut des Cultures de, de l'Islam, as an homage to her owns from which she learned so much, Sarah Ohaddu shows photographs of the handcrafters' hands, another way, way of paying tribute to tradition and traditional knowledge. Also on the performative mode is the work of two Tunisian dancers and choreographers, Selma and Sofia Nouissi. They graduated from the Conservatoire de Musique et de Danse and the Centre National de Danse in Tunis, and they hold also a diploma from France. Uh, their creations were shown uh, in France and in the Arab world and in Europe uh, since uh, 2004. And they collaborated also with digital artists for some works. And they use also modern uh, new technologies like Skype and Zoom and so on to reproduce their works and have a simultaneous, um, uh, let's say, uh, experience of, of it. Um, they produced uh, in 2011 a choreographic film inspired by the work of the Sejnan potters, potter in the city of Tunisia, which has been shown around the world in Paris, in London, in New York, in Denmark, and so on. Continuing their research into the ancestral gestures of the Sejnan craftswoman, the duo responded to the invitation for a new creation for Marseille, Provence in 2013, uh, with this work, which is a choreography entitled La Rusa, The Bride, and where they dance, they have a choreography where they represent the gestures of the potters who make these ceramics. Uh, they had also uh, performed in London in 2014, uh, live and on Skype at the Tate Modern Les Yeux d'Argos. And they were among the early promoters of the art festival Dream City in Tunis. Performances and gestures are not limited to two dimensions, but structure the artist's and the viewer's relation to space. We have already seen in the work of Sarah Ohaddu the use of architectural elements in order to create objects. And many artists are concerned with the specific female experience of space with, within Islamic urban and building structure. It is thus not surprising that the mashrabiya, the wooden separation panels used in traditional architecture that limit inner from the outer space, would inspire some artists, not only for its aesthetic, but also for its symbolic value. Samta Ben Yahya uh, is a well-known representative, uh, representative of this. Of Algerian origin, living in the Parisian region, she uses the motif of the Mosherbiya in her work in order to allow the visitor to get the sense of what it means to look outside through these non-glassed windows or wooden curtains. She installed Mashrabiya screens or inspired from Mashrabiya on existing windows in such different places as Berlin, Marseille, Casablanca, or Vienna. Uh, she makes the visitors, or she wants the visitor to experience what the invisible females that were present behind uh, the Mashrabiya could see without being seen, and having thus, in spite of their absence in the outer space, a sort of power over those they could see, but who could not see them, questioning so this very uh, often uh, told view that uh, this was a way of putting women aside without uh, giving them any kind of power. 
first female artist to practice etching in uh, Algeria, uh, Samta Ben Yahya's a reference to uh, Islamic art is made through an element of architecture present in daily life, in traditional architecture, and through questioning the spatial segregation between men and women. Another female artist who also works on this theme is German-Egyptian Susan Hefuna. Hefuna is known for producing artworks structured like Mashrabiyas, where one can read different words or sentences in Arabic or in English. Her latest project, which is not the one you see here on the screen, on this theme, the Mashrabiya project at the Museum for Art in Wood in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania in 2023, consisted of an important structure in Mashrabiya style in wood where visitors could communicate and relate to each other. Like Samta Ben Yahya, Hefuna does not reduce the Mashrabiya to a building structure creating the exclusion of women, but considers it as a peculiar architectural element allowing different types of interactions and participation. On a more symbolic level, she sees it as a kind of expression of her being in between, between Germany and Egypt, her two countries of origin. A way also, and she says, as she says, to express the disruptive and unifying elements of intercultural communication. Hefuna worked with craftsmen in Cairo who were transforming her designs into masharabias, giving those, those artisans the opportunity to use their skills in the context of contemporary art. For Hefuna, the mashrabiya is like calligraphy, but more abstract. It's like molecular structures, she says. There are different layers of interpretations for her, not only one truth, and this is what for her the mashrabiya symbolizes, and the observer is responsible for what he, she is observing. The writings in her mashrabiyas appear and disappear as one approaches or takes distance from them, giving also again the sense of indetermination. Uh, it can also be seen as a protection from the outside for the inside, the inner sphere, the intimate, maybe the Arab identity of the artist from the outer Western uh, environment. Yes, uh, like uh, Samta Ben Yahya's work, Hefunas is not only conceived in order to be contemplated, but to be used, to be walked through. It changes the visitor into a performer of different possible forms of interaction with the material and with other visitors. What should we take from these examples? I would like to come back to what I wrote in my previously quoted article. In this text, I came to the conclusion that the adoption by the younger generations of artists of the means of contemporary art, um, video installations, photography and performance, but also the end of pan-Arab nationalism since the 1990s, had led to a lesser interest in the production of an identitarian art based on elements of the Islamic heritage, among others. I said art has a, become a particular individual experience in a given context. Artists today express their reality, their life in an Islamic society, whatever this might mean, as a reflection of self on self within this society, end of quote. I think in some way this is still valid. However, it has to be nuanced. Since 2003, when the article was published, globalization has spread all over the world and lifestyles and consumption modes everywhere have become more and more standardized. If after World War II, artists wanted to preserve in their art forms and shapes belonging to previous civilizations of the region, in the third decade of the 21st century, a sense of loss of previous ways of production and living together prevails. What artisans do, and even the shape of their hands, hands used to producing objects, which bear the trace of this use, have to be commemorated, highlighted, kept in memory. This is true, of course, of diaspora artists, but concerns also those who live in the region where the gap between the parents and grandparents and the younger generations has constantly grown. 
the interconnected world produces a visual culture that is shared from one part of the world to another. On the one side, uniformizing, but also allowing peculiar images from a specific background to circulate and to be seen. There is also a willingness to show the value of popular classes of ordinary people and of women, often neglected when it comes to arts and even crafts, or of ethnic minorities like the Amazir in North Africa. It is a way of building and keeping the memory of a region in rapid change. And this memory is built on, in, on new media like videos, photography, or performance, or choreography, as we saw. However, there is also a continuity with what previous generations of artists did. As I tried to show, even artists expressing themselves in painting or sculpture had since a longer time tried to render movement, although on the surface of the canvas, having identified in the gesture of the calligrapher and not only in the final result of his gesture, meaning the script, an essential moment of Islamic art. And I would like to conclude with a quote from the Iranian artist living in Germany, Parastu Furhar, who fills a whole room of fictitious, illegible letters having no meaning, which are transformed into ornament. What can be understood initially as a loss of meaning, she says, and I quote, can instead be interpreted simply as an abstract visual language, an environment that cultivates subjective experience and liberates perception from the omnipotence of text. Thank you for your attention. Good afternoon, everybody. I want to start by thanking Hamid for inviting me to this really uh, very challenging and intriguing uh, conference. And uh, thank you, the audience, to have uh, survived until now. And I hope my uh, presentation will be Khita uh, Mohamisk. But allow me first uh, to make some framing remarks. Uh, as a Palestinian, I must start with the following. نترحم على الشهداء فلسطين ولبنان وندعو للشفاء العاجل للجرحى والمصابين وطبعا الحرية للمعتقلين والمعتقلات. And this brings me to uh, the second. This brings me to the second framing. Uh, of uh, you know uh, in the last year it seems that uh, the language that we use in the academia and the categories that we um, approach realities or analyze realities that this language or this discourse is expired and it's not relevant anymore to our realities but still, we need to uh, find kind of um, um, a station where to stand and look at these realities anew and start to think um, what type of language, what type of uh, epistemic shift we must do in order to uh, at least be honest with ourselves and the people we work with. Uh, because the realities that we live, at least uh, me as a Palestinian, the realities that I live are no longer coming across or the language that I use here and now uh, does not uh, uh, talk or uh, relate to what I live or the experience that people I know that they are living. In this vein, the project that I'm doing on El Labad started with something similar. Uh, 
uh, as a Palestinian, I have, and other Palestinians for sure have the same feeling regarding history. History as something that we were expelled from. So I was, uh, you know, exploring different models of doing history through art and through literature in order to try and rebuild, rebuild a different type of history, a history that uh, will not exclude uh, any type of human existence. Uh, and in this manner, I arrived or started to engage with El Abad and uh, to understand how he, in his time, with all the contradictions that he lived through, tried to make a different history, an alternative modernity, if you want, or a decolonizing the uh, moment. And he used a specific concept in Arabic, which is Muasara. Muasara, uh, contemporaneity, but I don't know if translating it would uh, yeah, exhaust uh, the meaning. So what I will present to you today is, by the way, I am a social scientist, so uh, <laughs> apropos uh, art history and uh, social sciences. Uh, officially, I earn my money by doing anthropology. Uh, uh, so uh, what is the, um, let's say, the theoretical frame that I am uh, standing on is trying to understand the interrelation between social the social historical processes and visual thinking, or talking about visual thinking and uh, later on uh, visual narratives as practiced by El Abad. So what I'm trying to do is to understand the historical model of, combi of combining the realities and the contradictions that people live through and how they try to reorder reality visually, either by thinking visually or by narrating the reality in, on visual term in order to reorder it and see um, different horizons. Okay, after all these uh, fillings of remarks, I will um, start to talk about El Abad. I will argue that El Abad's concept of history is based on alternative modernity, or if you want, uh, um, distinct, distinct, something distinct from colonial and Western models, which is particularly, particularly Egyptian, Arab, and Islamic. Now, I won't quote him directly, but most of the arguments, I, if, if anyone of you wants to go for references or for archives, I could give you the uh, references directly. For him, any artwork should primarily engage with its muasara, with its contemporary moment. So he's interested in history, not because of history as such, but to understand and intervene in the present moment. So in that sense, he, in that sense, he is a very modernist uh, artist. This alternative Muasara uh, has led him to an acute awareness of time and its rhythmic movement across the past, the present, and the future. In this reflective context of reclaiming the present, El Labad draws upon several histories, not only Arab Islamic, but also modern ones, integrating them into his artwork as tributary, rawafid in Arabic, molded into contemporary forms. Now, the interesting um, oops. the interesting thing that he did this in different media. It wasn't uh, yani, uh, specified to a specific media, such as calligraphy or uh, illustrations or children's uh, literature, all these media that he worked with. Now, in each medium he worked in, El Lepad's work demonstrated the formalistic aspects of these histories. Like he took formalistic aspects 
from these histories and he molded them into the body of the artwork itself. So it's not about content, it's about form. There is a lot of uh, kind of formalistic interventions that he performs in his artwork and less so on the content level. Less so on the content level, but there is something in the molding in this formalistic or uh, formalism that is he is producing. Now, today I want to present two such Rawafi tributaries that he used. The history of modern Egyptian art and his position in this lineage. He's kind of creating a family lineage. And the second is the bookmaking and the uh, calligraphy as something that he uh, uh, kind of conjured from the past into his, his present, but not in the literal sense, but uh, again, he took some formalistic aspects and embodied them in his artwork. Now, uh, I want, in order to make um, my argument as lucid as possible, I found myself uh, obliged to do history, myself on his history. So I want to tell his uh, kind of life story, because in, uh, I think it's very important to understand um, the context in which he became aware of this kind of, of uh, approaching history. In his many interviews, Ilabad relates his childhood, upbringing, and socio-visual environment that contributed to his formation as an artist concerned with visual culture and its printed products. He tells us that he was born in 1940 to a family that had recently moved to Cairo from Kafr al-Sheikh, a village in the Nile Delta area, due to his father's job as an Azharite sheikh. Moreover, his thesis that each year he spent four months of his summer vacations in the Delta, and that part of his childhood visual memories were formed during these times. This socio-economic and cultural background, and necessarily the visual culture as accessible to him, position in Labad in the context of the rural to urban migration in Egyptian society during World War II and its transformation as a result of that. Despite seemingly conservative background of his father's profession, El Labad describes his family as a variation of the Afandiya socioeconomic group from the countryside, which primarily relied on modern educational institutions to integrate into the Kyrene society and the public sphere in Egypt in general. Now, um, a major characteristic of the Efendia group at that time was its, its strong sense of belonging to the Egyptian national community and its broader Arab and Islamic circles of identification, alongside a deep rejection of Western colonial influence. In his interviews and dialogues, Ilabad explains how these structures of feeling shaped his visual culture and its memories. Now, the Afandiya group is characterized by its fragile socio-economic standing. It's very fragile and it's very modern, in, colonial modern in the sense. It was recently formed and this, uh, um, these individuals were almost obsessed and telling their life stories and histories. And the most, uh, the archetype of such a genre is Ta Hussein al Ayyam. The story of a boy in Saeed or in the Delta that through uh, modern education starts from really, um, uh, let's say, underdeveloped context until he becomes uh, a minister in the government. Now, this FNDA group, what characterizes it, it's, it's, let's say, in a class relation or the class structure in the Egyptian society, 
they are not regular workers, unionized or uh, and they are not middle, middle, upper class. They are in between. And this sense of fragility uh, made them to over-invest in framing themselves all the time through narrative. And these guys became later the carrier of the post-independent uh, Egyptian state. And in a sense, th their history is tragic. It's full of, uh, you know, um, crises on different levels. And in Labad, his sense of history and, and his sense of visually narrating this group through the prisms of Egyptian nationalism, uh, Arab nationalism, and Islamic identity, whatever is that, uh, is very center, central to his uh, uh, artistic project. Now, this is one thing, and in my, yani, what I argue that this class positionality is very formative uh, uh, for uh, a bad at many levels that I will try to uh, explain. Okay. Now, sometimes as researchers, we are lucky, like literally lucky. And I was lucky that I think it's the first and the last time <laughs> that I located uh, a bad work, published work. Um, as you will see uh, at this one. It turns out that starting from uh, the early 50s, since he was 11, 12, he was uh, uh, yani publishing his uh, work, literary and uh, visual, in different children's magazine in Cairo at that time. One of the major uh, children's magazine was Sandibad. And starting from uh, 1952, he was 12 years old. Until 1960, I found all the, uh, located all his uh, work across these years, formative years, and it turns out that he was very prolific. He published on a, on a, a weekly basis. On a weekly basis for eight years, he published his, uh, such as this, Mohammed uh, um, Najib was the first uh, president of Egypt after the uh, revolution of uh, July 52. This is in 1952, this is the first one. And in this way, I could, I have traced his development. And in that sense, it's uh, interesting. Now, the story becomes more interesting because in Sindibad, he meets Hussein Bikar. Hussein Bikar is one of the leading uh, figures of the second generation or second, third generation of Egyptian artists. Uh, and Hussein Bikar was the artistic director of Sindibad. So the relation developed, that developed between them is of Osta and Sabi, or master and disciple. And the interesting thing is that they, they worked together for eight years until at the end of that, uh, time, El Abad became the artistic director, took the position of Hussein Bikar. So it's interesting, he started as a young kid of 12 years old who uh, corresponded with the, and, uh, published with the magazine and published his work uh, on the reader sections to become the... Uh, I will try to visually show you, this is the first one. This is in 1945. This is Gandhi. You see, this is Gandhi, uh, Faisal al Awal of Iraq, and Idris al Sanusi of Libya. At that time, they were. Uh, and this is Labad. 
uh, at that time of 13, 14 years old. Now, at the same year, uh, so this is one of the first uh, cartoons or caricatures, whatever you want to call it, uh, of Labad. It says, uh, look at Mars, or see Mars. This is, we are still in Sindibad. <coughs> this is uh, self-portrait in uh, 19, 1955. This one, he already an artist working in Sindibad as an artist. Arrahala Tomatim. And already we start to see uh, kind of uh, uh, his visual language is develop developing and starting to take uh, shape. Interestingly enough, that uh, first he went to the to a dental college in the University of Cairo, and then he left and went to the College of Fine Arts to study with uh, under um, Hussain Bikar was a main figure at the College of Fine Arts. Okay. Now, the, there is an important thing. Part of the socialization that he went through is this generational sequence. You have a, a master and disciple uh, and the generational sequence of artists is a very important um, element in his socialization, which later became, or he expressed it in writing the modern history of Egyptian art and positioning himself in this line of, of generations, of generations of artists. But the, one of the important things and after graduating is his uh, conscious decision that he will not make uh, conventional, traditional art, such as easel painting or this, but to go and to work in the uh, um, uh, mass, uh, mass media, at that time the print, and this is changed, the, the impact on this was very crucial. Uh, in contrast to the um, artists that Zena presented earlier this morning, Dia uh, Azzawi, Nadir Nab'a, all these people, they moved between the print and the traditional uh, easel painting and all these genres. El Labad didn't. He didn't. And uh, this is an interesting uh, uh, point that we will see how it will affect him later. I just want to show you this also uh, Sindibad time. This is when he became the, this is the first cover that he designed for Sindibad. And we see uh, a young student uh, drawing his master, and it was a joke, uh, very, uh, yani, uh, not a joke, how you call it in English, Yudaib, uh, teasing his master, Sam uh, uh, So this is the first cover that Ilabad did. Also about lucky, being lucky, I, uh, this is uh, one of the, not the one, the only uh, work that I uh, could locate from his uh, time at the College of Fine Arts. This is typical uh, Hussain Bikar. It's the influence of Hussain Bikar is, um, I didn't bring any visuals of Hussain Bikar because of the time limitations. But this is typical Hussein Bikar and he, uh, the influence of Hussein Bikar on Illa. But this is uh, the time of him being student. Now, he graduated 
had made the, his decision not to go and deal with Western uh, art genres and to uh, use um, uh, mass communication on mass media. Now, this is an interesting point. This is he has this acute perception of um, print capitalism, the contradictions that it entails, uh, his political consciousness, uh, what, what, what does he want to do with his art, and all these questions were present. Now, at that time, in the early 60s, there was what we call in Arabic, or in certain Arabic, الغزو الثقافي الأمريكي عن طريق المجلات الأطفال. Such as Miki, um, you know, all these figures, Superman, all these, Tantan also was there. So, Ilabad and a group of uh, Egyptian intellectuals and, uh, and political activists um, started an initiative and they made their own children's magazine. They called it Karawan. This Karawan was outside the Egyptian establishment at the time. Um, it's a low budget production, but its visuals and its narrative and it's uh, had a lasting impact on many other uh, children's magazines and book production also, or book making. I just want you to sense the, the cover is not uh, by Ilabad, it's by Mustafa, uh, but Ilabad designed the cover, designed this. He was the artistic editor of this. Unfortunately, after one year, after uh, 30 um, issues, they had to close it. This is Ilabad in Karawan. Um, it's called Jarjir, Sba'at Tawashir. Oh, I have only five minutes. I'm not lucky with time. <laughs> okay, this is also the 60s. I will go through the visuals of the 60s. It's al hidha al raqis He wrote and designed and uh, illustrated. All the, all, it's for him, it's this one, as uh, uh, Zena uh, explained, the book became uh, an artwork uh, a political arg uh, position, uh, kind of a total art work, if you want. Um, he, um, from the paper, the, what paper to use, until the what font to use, uh, and all these things, and who, uh, and to write the story. And for him, uh, after that, he worked with Samir. This is after 1967. I don't know if somebody here grew up in the Arab world. Reading Samir. Reading Samir. So Samir was kind of, you know, a mainstream, but not exactly mainstream, because some of the really very creative and very innovative artists who worked there, such as Hijazi and others, and they uh, brought him here. Later, this uh, idea of bookmaking, because he defined himself as Sana Kitab, brought him to look at the Islamic history of bookmaking, which is interesting. So these two uh, tributaries, the generational sequence and the Islamic bookmaking, came out of his practice. Like, these are uh, practices that uh, were a daily uh, issues for him to deal with. He didn't go back uh, for the sake of uh, yani bringing history, but it was uh, issues that he dealt with in his practices. I want to... Okay. 1967, in Naksa, Nasser died, Sadat came. Many Egyptian uh, artists and intellectuals migrated to Beirut. 
migrated to Beirut in order to and started a new phase in their career. One of them is El Labad. El Labad was recruited by Nabil Shaf and most probably by Mahjoub Omar also uh, to head a new project. Uh, they built a publishing house for uh, children's literature. They named it Dar al Fatal Arabi. And El Labad, with this experience, took all these rawafid of his past experience and brought them to another level. Really, something uh, new. A new, not in the sense that they were not there. Most uh, important in this regard, his intervention of visually thinking reality. So, Bikar, and, uh, and I, I really uh, recommend you to read uh, Sylvia's book about uh, modernity, because kind of uh, in a dialogue we, uh, we have talked about it. Bikar was one of the, the, gener the third generation that tried to um, kind of ta'lif, to create um, a visual language based on the Egyptian context and its histories. What Bikar did is he created kind of a scene. It's kind of a visual narrative. His student, Labad, was not satisfied with visual narratives. He wanted uh, to move one step further and to organize the page according to a visual logic or a visual concept. So the organizing principle of the page is visual. In this relation, the text or the narrative becomes only one element among others in designing the page. And these uh, experimentations matured in Beirut. And it's not coincident that they matured in Beirut. This is his collaboration with Zakaria Tamir and Dar al Fatal Arabi. It's called the home, Al Bayt. It's a poster and uh, in the format of a book. This he did in 1985. It's called the Palestine Alphabet, Alif Bayit, Palestine. Now, in Beirut, as in Beirut, he met so many uh, Arab artists, international artists. And uh, this is one or ten? One. one. Oh, I thought ten. In <laughs> <laughs> uh, Beirut, he uh, started to write it to uh, um, yani, um, critical, critically reflect on himself as an artist and locate himself vis a vis Arab artists and other international uh, interlocutors. And at that moment, he started to write history, the history of vision, and the history Can of visual conclude, art. you please, Ismail? Yeah. Can you conclude? OK. To be, uh, uh, to conclude, I wanted to uh, show you another, but I just, this is another. It's a compilation of essays that he wrote and started to write in 1985, in which he wrote the history of uh, the Egyptian art field and the history of bookmaking in uh, Islamic uh, history. I just want to, he started with Saru Khan, probably uh, some of you know him, then moved to Abdul Samia, but I wanted to analyze this text, but maybe on the question uh, uh, section I will talk about it. This is, he claims that Salah Jaheen is the 
the uh, the one who established the Egyptian caricaturist uh, caricature school and uh, these are familiar also from uh, Wendy's uh, presentation and uh, uh, Sylvia's presentation but the interesting one is Taqalid Jamila fil Kitab al Arabi, which I uh, at least plan to analyze the text. The very interesting thing about him is that he's so passionate about these topics. He loves them and he presents them as something beautiful and gratifying and not, he has no sense of, uh, how would say, animosity toward this. Uh, there's no anxiety of, of influence or uh, Islamic culture is bad, I want to Islamic history. Uh, not of, the, of this sort, on the contrary. He presents them as something to live the mu'asara through them, but again, on formalistic level and not on content level. Uh, thank you, and... Uh, thank you. I, I, I know it's a bit frustrating, no, but uh, Arif, uh, we have to deal with time. So. The floor is yours for any questions, please. I, I think there is a lot of food for thought, so please, Mike. Thanks very much. First of all, thank you for two excellent papers. Um, I'd like to ask a question of uh, Sylvia, if I may. Um, this is such a, a rich field, and I, I love what you're doing, extending it to um, thinking about how the, the gestures involved in, in traditional crafts are being reproduced. I wondered um, if you could say something about uh, Zulikha Bouabdala. Um, I noticed that she was in your um, title at the beginning, and of course you must have been uh, uh, restricted uh, <laughs> with the time, and uh, so I wanted to give you a chance to say something about her. Uh well, I, I took this quote because I liked it, because this came from the idea that this was in a time when she used the Arabic letter. She had a series called the Hub, and then she and she made images with these letters. I mean, she's not the only one uh, artist in the Arab world who would, would really make figures, not in the Islamic tradition, very differently. Another one much earlier than her and from Egypt is Hamid Abdallah, who he also made uh, he used letters in order to shape figures. So I just, I didn't want, it's not that I didn't have time to speak about her. I just n took her quote because I thought I didn't want to speak about making images, but ab about representing without really making images or new images. This was my idea, and I liked what she said there. So that's, sorry if I cannot give you more uh, responses. I don't know. If I may, uh, what is interesting about Zulikha Abu Abdullah is that her, her, her mother uh, was the head of the uh, Contemporary Art Museum in, in Algeria and uh, she, she was raised in arts and then she, in order to emancipate herself from Western art, uh, she went into a deconstruction uh, process where she's working with collage uh, on uh, various works of art in order to reproduce differently uh, another grammar for, for art. So, so this is just, yeah. Uh, thank you. Uh, just before my question, five years ago, we had an exhibition in this building about Moroccan artists. And one of them, the famous one who came together, who talked about his, his work is Mahdi Qutb, who is now the head of the Moroccan museum, museums. And right now, there is an exhibition of his work at the Institute of the Monde Arabe in Paris. So if anyone is in, in Paris, I would recommend to go and see his complete work. My question to Sylvia is that uh, the ladies you have, or the Moroccan artists you have spoken about, do you know if they have gone to Casablanca Art School? or Paris art school, or self-educated. Which one you mean? Uh, we, you talked about with two, Farida? No, Farid Belkahia. 
Farid Belkahia, yes, he was in Casablanca. Uh, he was the director of the Casablanca Art School. So. Uh, no, but Farid. Mahdi? Sorry? He was trained in France, yes, but. Uh, she was in France? Yeah. So yeah. I. But, yeah. Yes. And Sarah Ohaddo, she studied in France. She, she had got her diploma in France, but then she went back to Morocco because she wanted really to live with the handcrafters and just uh, follow up with this practice, with what she had learned in France. So this is... Yeah, fine. Thank you. I just want to ask a question to Sylvia as well, because I know you quoted Farid uh, by saying tr our tradition is futurist. I only wonder how far can we actually take these cultural tropes that are now very much indicative of our dislocation of, let's say, modernity by being counter-modernist, -moder while also be be taking part in, I think, the larger globalized world and also this trans, uh, tra transatlantic and trans-identity. Trans because I believe it, it becomes rhizomatic to an extent, and I don't know how that infection can then no longer be just located in one specific region. How can you take the specific, turn it universal, but then contemporarily criticize it for, for its own tradition? Yeah. Thank you for your question. Uh, by the way, thank you for the uh, tip with the exhibition of Mahdi Qutbi, whose work I, I know, know, of course. Yeah, um, well, the idea is not, uh, I mean, it's really uh, something that um, it's to, create a kind of modernity. I mean, we are, we are there in the 60s and 70s, so uh, the way of thinking and of theorizing was also very much different from what it was here. But uh, the school of Casablanca, by the way, and there has been a lot of publications uh, in the last few years about it, um, was considered itself tiermondist, the yani third world just. And they were open to the arts in the whole world. They were publishing mostly in French. I mean, they, are, they had all, most of them studied in France and were very much, they all read French Fanon and so on. So this was the universal part of their thinking. I would say their thinking was, I'm not sure if it was universal, but anyway, opened. It was not just limited to Morocco. But on the, on the other hand, I think this is more a kind of need also or after independence where there was a strong feeling which uh, was very um, important in the thinking was to find back what the culture they had before and which had been despised by colonialism. Uh, this was one part of it. This is why also there was this need to um, give it a place in the artistic scene and saying what our ancestors, or not our ancestors, our parents or grandparents did is something that um, belongs to the same realm and to the same level of uh, art that we have adopted from the West. This is one thing. The other thing is that in Morocco, as in other countries, you had the school of Tangiers and of Casablanca, which were, uh, Tetuan, yeah, which were uh, teaching um, Beaux-Arts kind, more Orientalist-oriented uh, kind of painting. So a representation, I mean, you know the question of Orientalism, of the Orient uh, represented and invented by the West. And so it, th there were these two points. So deconstructing this vision of, you know, uh, dancers and also this exoticizing vision, which is also the vision of, in some way, but not entirely, of the Ecole de Tunis in Tunisia, which uh, Mahdawi criticized. And on the other hand, to say what we were producing uh, in our countries is has the same kind of noblesse as the art that we imported. I think this was the kind of uh, uh, notions and structure in which they were thinking. Uh, but with this uh, very strong leftist, I mean, we, uh, this is also not important, a very strong leftist thinking, tiermondism, which is also kind of leftist thinking. So also the leftist, leftist thinking brought them to 
to be wanting to integrate what was more popular culture and which was maybe even despised not only by the French colonialists but also by the elites um, into the main cultural field. This was so these were the two points I would say. I don't know if I answer your question. Yeah, but futurist, I don't know, maybe futurist in English has not, because this is a translation, of, he said it in French. He didn't say it in Arabic. So he said, no, uh, notre tradition est futuriste. So futurist in French might have another slight um, uh, yeah, connotation than in English. It's, it's going towards the future, you know? It's more something like in this direction, I would say, um, which is maybe a little bit less contained in the English word, but I'm not sure maybe if there is somebody linguist. That's how I would understand, and, and of course we don't have to understand futurist in the sense of the futurist art movement, or in the way it is used, now we have Arab futurism or Afrofuturism, which are contemporary art movements, it's not at all in this kind of category, because they were all uh, doing easel, I mean painting, yes, easel painting, painting and sculpture mainly, so. Uh, I would say it means, uh, it allows us to project ourselves in the yeah. future. Yes. That's, that's what it means, and that allows us to project ourselves in the future. In terms of like how, how could you have pushed it towards the futurism in the sense of these practicing artists now holding that culture as a projection of their own future? No, but the yeah, idea I is... Terminology. I really <coughs> don't understand Yeah. I mean, I have a related question. Yeah, yeah, it's a movement toward, yeah. towards yeah. the foot of it. So it's, it's really not uh, to be understood. I mean, it's... The meaning is, going back to our past, we, are, we will build our future. There is a very strong notion also of building something new. Mm -hmm. I think this is very important, which is not contained in the sentence, but in other uh, th uh, things they wrote and said and, uh, well, filmed and everything. Yeah. Yes. Uh, I, I think that, that there's, some, there's something, there's a parallel to be drawn between those two papers, and it's, thank you very much. There is, there is that moment where, just going back to Belkaria's, uh, our, our, that moment of our tradition is revolutionary. It is a revolutionary moment. Mm -hmm. And uh, Sylvia, in your presentation, you gave us a long history up until 2003. And I've, I've been, the question for me was, when is it that it remains revolutionary, that going back to tradition, and when is it that it becomes a nostalgia? Right, and I think something something that th we need to tease out that th th that uh, difference, and uh, specifically the connection here to El Labad, which was also a radical moment of um, of building, thinking of tradition, but to build ahead, to build the future, to build a post-colonial future. It was a moment of decolonization, and that that's true. And that's actually also the distinction he, that we can see in the generation between him and Bikar. Bikar was still also working in some of his earlier work within an Orientalist mm -hmm. representation uh, of, um, of orientalizing the self, which, which um, Labat breaks radically from. But my question to you again is about the politics here and how much is it part of the tributaries that you're, Rawafet, that you're talking about and his socialist politics. And maybe you can develop a bit of that because that also relates to Belkahis. I will go first. Yeah, okay. uh, this will, um, we don't have any more time for questions, so please, uh, okay. the floor is yours. Um, again, I think in order to unpack these questions, uh, about the temporal and uh, uh, in most part on the um, axis of time people are oriented, uh, in my opinion, we need to unpack it by reading the socio-historical and economic and political context. Uh, this is, uh, will, uh, I would say, demystify the idea of, or the aura that we live through by these name, names, even as a nostalgic past. So what I did is, uh, uh, my move is to go and dig into the socioeconomic background that he came from and his positionality in the uh, Egyptian um, context at that time. Of course, because 
has a different positionality, different trajectories. And um, usually in the uh, Egyptian public discourse, they say that uh, Bikar, you know, Bikar is, uh, his family immigrated from Turkey to Egypt in the early uh, 20th century after the coup in 19, I think, 05 or something like that, and they uh, came to Alexandria. So he's this cosmopolitan Alexandrian uh, setting, and then uh, um, slowly he moved into the becoming naturalized Egyptian subject, uh, I mean culturally. El Abad has a different uh, positionality. So these movements uh, were reflected uh, in the art that they made, and on the references and the meanings that they tried to uh, produce. So in that sense, I, I really think the positionality of an artist has to do. This is not, it's not in a deterministic way, but uh, I would say the universe, the universe that he is working through is really a, a contingent uh, on his uh, socioeconomic positionalities. Yes, I would add, a thank you, Zaina, for your question. I think we could uh, discuss for hours. It's a very interesting question, but to make it short, I guess somewhere in the 1980s, it starts really to become nostalgia. If you look, uh, for instance, at the Horofia as a movement, it's very creative for a certain time, but then it becomes a kind of even quote of quote and requote of some kind of letters, Arabic letters, and so on. But I think it's it's a discussion that uh, yes should be made more intensely. Thank you. Thank you. I I feel like every session has just opened our appetite for more. Thank you, Hamid, and I think we're moving to the closing remarks. Thank you. Excellent, thank you very much. Uh, good evening, good afternoon. So after uh, two very uh, compact yet very rich days of the conference, uh, so we will have the closing remarks. Uh, I'm some, somehow overwhelmed with uh, the contents and uh, different perspectives and the variety of talks uh, that I'm sure you would agree with me. So that's why I've asked a member of our esteemed speakers to just join me to uh, summarize some highlights of uh, these two days. And uh, so, yes, uh, I think without further ado, I will start, I will ask another to uh, yeah, I mean, 10 minutes each, I would appreciate, and then I will... I mean, yeah, uh, not pre haven't, and don't have anything prepared for this, but um, 10 minutes, um, um, we'll try. I first really want to thank you, Hamid, not just because you brought us together to discuss the various topics that we had, but you actually also gave us a moment, a, a, a minute of freedom and, and to breathe. 
Um, as you know, we heard um, today particularly, um, th and, and that kind of made me feel guilty as I am the first speaker in this conference, um, and sort of, you know, just sort of launched into my topic without necessarily acknowledging this moment of history. And I am a daughter of a Palestinian mother, an Iraqi father, an Iranian grandmother who grew up in going to, to Beirut for my youth and spend a lot of time in Marjayoun in the south because where my, my aunt was married. So I, you know, this, this sort of um, entanglement of the region and the wars is really literally my life story. But I also am suffocated in um, the U.S. at the moment, and so this is this has been a very um, great, you know, sort of moment to breathe. While we kind of look at, you know, learn about new artists. Thank you. Learn about new artists, new approaches to material. Um, lots of issues of importance that we probably should take uh, uh, further, um, and issues of solidarity that are very important. And most importantly, what I want to talk about are two things. Um, first, the new approaches, because as Smail said, and many said in various ways, that what we have been doing as academics needs to, is sort of necessarily um, not as relevant to what we, you know, as it was before. Different things are, you know, are happening. Uh, we are faced and challenged by, by different um, uh, you know, moments of time that sort of kind of you know, forces us to look at what we do and how we do in a different way. How activism must be part of what we do, despite of the fact that we were all trained to be disinterested um, uh, you know, scholars. I don't even know what that really means. But, you know, uh, so that one thing, and I probably won't even um, talk about, you know, in 10 minutes, because I, I would really like to have a, uh, have a dialogue more about this before. How do we now do our research in a relevant way to the history that is unfolding in front of us while we are restricted by many things, you know, many um, uh, powers around us? And two, um, the majority of us spoke of, you know, sort of more contemporary works. But you know what uh, today sort of brought also to the table is that the issue of modernism and modernity is not resolved. That we still have you know um, ways to think about it. You know, um, and I say that because I next in few days I will be talking about. Arab modernism, you know, which is something that would require a lot of qualifications. But you know, to talk about. Um, the unfolding or the use of the Arabic letter to talk about what Bilkahia was doing with the uh, uh, um, Casablanca school. I think we should go back to reevaluate, you know, in, oh, many of us have been writing about this for decades now, Sylvia, right? So, Iftikhar, um, you know, so maybe in fact we need to go back to look at these issues from today's perspective, as we see this, this moment of history unfolding in front of us and see the parallels of what was happening, you know, maybe in the 1950s and 60s as well, that will require us to look at things from, you know, different perspectives and our scholarship to be, you know, addressed from a different perspective. I don't know if this is what you had in mind when you asked me to, to be on this table, but I really think that, you know, this is something that we should all consider together because Clearly, we are all frustrated by one way or the other of what's happening in, the, in, the, in our worlds and how we are able or not able to address them. Thank you. Uh, yes, but I wasn't, uh, uh, I wasn't anticipating having to speak either, but I'd just like to say something about infrastructures because while we have this academic problem and you're talking about our research, we are also paid by institutions, including government funding. And this is a very big problem, and we can't just pretend that we're floating around doing research. Um, this also extends to, the, uh, to, to one comment I was going to make, uh, really, about the last session, but one can't just look at style, whether or not these people are accepting or rejecting Western or their local or, you know, millennial traditions and not talk about the infrastructures of what might have been rather minuscule art worlds, but I don't know about it. You can't just be an artist in Casablanca with nobody buying your work 
and uh, how that relates to elites or other questions is something very important. So there is a whole question not only of infrastructures at the receiving end that I think need addressing, but also I just, um, you know, in England we say those who can do, those who can't teach, which I'm sure we would all raise up uh, um, uh, in reaction against. But the fact is that <clears throat> um, the teachers in these schools and the teachers in France, for example, Taslitsky uh, never sold a work of art in his life. That's why he was able to have such a huge retrospective. It was either uh, subsidized by the Communist Party and then he was a professor at the École des, des Arts Décoratifs, which seems to be like a kind of clearing area for talented communists. So the fact is, though, I did want to just speak up for sympathetic teachers in art schools who may not be the people we're now looking at. Um, one of the phrases that came up incredibly rapidly in the last session was anxiety of influence, which I'm sure we all know, you know, refers to Harold Bloom's book of 1973. But I think this question of um, people's past and their training and the anxiety and the embrace of the old or the new is quite interesting to look at through that spectrum. But the thing that is most interesting, perhaps, is not uh, what it's in conjunction, if you like, with this crisis of academe, is this idea of a, a new thirst for a sacred, which is not being... Um, uh, addressed in a way which perhaps we might like it to be addressed or even produced by contemporary art. And it made me think in actually the session before it that one of the people we haven't mentioned uh, whose book is always neglected is Dominique Girard, who as early as 1975 wrote the book Le Violence et le Sacré, but it was translated Violence and the Sacred. And it seems to me that there is something going on here, especially to do with the witnessing of death, which has been a theme through many papers. And it was actually that book which underpinned the later, uh, together with others, of course, the later writings of Giorgio Agamben and the idea of the nomos of the camp. Uh, for for contemporary life. So I think a lot is going on, but perhaps in terms of um, putting together two things that have not been put together as they should with a gesture toward Dominique Girard, I'd like to uh, just, in your minds, put together this conjunction of violence and the sacred. Uh, well, uh, thank you. Thanks again, Hamid, for, uh, yeah, uh, I, um, I, tried, I tried to put together things in order to uh, say something that is not uh, uh, redundant and at the same time taking into consideration a lot of things that we heard with very rich program. Um, I think that going back to the uh, metaphor I used uh, at the beginning in my presentation of hedgehog and foxes, I think we, we saw both. And we saw at the same time people who were looking at the la a landscape or uh, could it be national, regional or, or thematic, uh, or, but also um, uh, case studies and very localized case studies. And that was very interesting to see sometimes we're, we're looking at the landscape and sometimes we're digging into one, one case. Um, second point, of course, is that we were all uh, concerned by the moment. We're not out of place. We're concerned with this moment, which is very critical, very violent moment we're g going into. And, and, uh, yeah. uh, but um, I, I, my, my, the, the only way I found to uh, try to say something is in three in three times the first one uh, is um, about this this two words uh, history and memory that were in the in the title that have been in a certain sense uh, extended uh, through archives tradition heritage loss ruins so uh, first uh, we see that we have all these things that came in relation with history and memory, but also the relation to the present, uh, uh, and that has we've been fluctuating all the time. And in relation with the with this, uh, there is the 
the sense of place, uh, not only of time, but also the sense of place. And in the sense of place, we saw that we were sometimes talking about the local place and sometimes the national states, and sometimes we were talking about this dialogue tension between poetics and politics, and sometimes we were all the time talking about positionality uh, and positions. So, and second is the attitude we had with these questions, this uh, uh, spectrum uh, of history and memory going into ruins. Uh, uh, sometimes we were in nostalgia, sometimes mourning, sometimes melancholy, but sometimes also recognition, and uh, recognition in the sense of uh, knowing again, uh, recognition, knowing again, which is a very good point because, and also we went into recreation, reinvention, decolonization. So this is, this is one, so, and I think it was very interesting in this sense that we went through these different layers uh, without uh, uh, having talked about this before. The second uh, uh, entry I suggest is the, the notion of plura plurality. It came in various ways, and I think it came in relation with also the, the question of how we deal with the plural uh, in terms of mixity, hybridity, in terms of forms, etc., but also in terms of blur blurring boundaries between tradition and modernity, between cultural heritage and the universal, between academic training and technology, indigenous know-how. We were all the time uh, looking at these questions, and also in terms of form, we looked at collage, erasures, mm -hmm. uh, transformations, creative artifacts, uh, but in general, and something, and this goes back to what you were saying, the question of plurality and complexity leads us again to talk about secularization, and what does, what does it mean to be secular and at the same time considering plurality without downplaying either Islam, for example, as a, as a heritage, but also. So this, is, this has been, and this means that the centrality of democratic ethos when considering the question of art and art history in our. But, and in relation with this point, uh, I, 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 I want to make a side, a side uh, remark about uh, my question yesterday that I couldn't uh, ask uh, uh, Hamid Dabashi about Saud Heimlich, the uncanny. Oh, yeah. Uh, um, uh, and, and this also has to do with, with the question of plurality. Because if, if we consider Palestine as the strain, the, strange, uh, the, strange, the strangeness of the familiar uh, uh, today, and the fact that we talk, consider also from Freud that the unconscious is the strangest of the familiar for, from within, uh, I, I wanted to I want to say uh, a side point is that Ibn Rushd Averwes, the the, the 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 Andalusian philosopher, has been compared to Freud uh, by a very good scholar uh, because he was considered as the uh, as the the, the uncanny from uh, the, the Christian uh, tradition uh, while he was talking about the collective intellect. Uh, and, and this is why I'm raising this. It, this brings us back to something very important we've been talking about, is that a Muslim rationalist, as it could be an, an artist, uh, seen from Europe is looked at as a foreigner, as an other, while while we are considering this notion of the uncanny, maybe we can think of him as part of a plurality to re-articulate. Maybe this is a, a major question. When we talk from a cross-cultural, transcultural point of view, we can think about this part of plurality within West. And I finish by my third entry is fairness. Fair, I, I, I say fairness because we have to be fair towards, and this came in different ways, towards the language, the grammar, the creative expression, what the, what's the trajectory of the artist, all these questions. How, how to be fair from an academic point of view to, towards this? What does it mean to talk about and or have dialogue with or reveal or curate or describe or translate the, the artistic expressions, utterances, positions, 
understanding. This has is left as as a as a question because uh, and and here many have been trying to find out ways of being uh, fair either by going back to the context or affiliation or trajectories or but also in accepting ambiguities and paradoxes. And I think here, I, I finish, and this is because I, I, I would like, again, to thank, uh, thank her. Um, uh, sorry. Sorry, I'm very bad at names. Um, Wendy. Uh, I want to thank Wendy of talking about WOW, because uh, maybe um, uh, instead of the O, oh, we could have the WOW, O, oh, which means the or, you could have the well, which is the end. <coughs> no, she didn't talk about O, oh, but I'm. Oh, oh, oh. Oh. I'm saying instead of the O, oh, we should go to the well. Why? Because the O oh makes us into the binary oppositions, and the well allows us for complexity, allows to say that we're adding one to the other in order to understand and not excluding one by the other in terms of binary. Thank you. I just wanted to add one thing because, you know, this thing that kept coming up today and, and this thing about tension between past and present, um, modernity, you know, the, the past and the new, and learning the Western or comparing Ibn Rushd to uh, Freud. I mean, I think this is, we talk about decolonizing and we talk about the post-colonial and we talk about moving on, yet we still do these, this comparative work. I think this is the first thing that we need to do. I mean, um, Bil Kahia, as a matter of fact, himself, who, as, as he told me, when he went to Paris to study, he found himself a stranger. He saw what the, what the Beaux-Arts was teaching him has nothing to do with what Morocco was like or going to be. So he actually went to Prague to finish his, his education, where he thought it was more relevant to what he was doing, where the future that he was thinking about was for later on as well to extend by actually just thinking about, you know, I mean, we keep saying they learned the, the Western way, they accept the Western way, they don't accept the Western way. You know, by putting it in the context that they, they were doing, you know, I mean, then we would probably not even use this language anymore because this didn't become an issue until the 70s and 80s. It was not an issue when Jawad Salim was doing it. It was not an issue even when Belkahia was doing it because to them, they were just participating in that plurality that, you know, Dries is, is mentioning now. And then we just sort of got stuck on this notion of that there is a West and then there is an other, the binary, and that you know there is an acceptance or a rejection of it. Something we don't do today in the in the sort of you know global contemporary world that we know is not global at all, yet we kind of stick to that and we accept the contemporary artist as the contemporary artist, an individual doing what he wants to do um, in any space, whether they're studying here or there, hyphenated identities and so on. Why can't we extend that same way of thinking back to modernity, to modernism, and think that those artists were exactly doing the same thing? Look at the historical context of what happened, yes, the colonial um, uh, violence of that moment, and then what they wanted to achieve and how they were achieving it. I mean, many of us have tried to to speak of the non-European roots of modernism, but you know we're always uh, sort of re rejected as ap apologetic. The reality is that you know Ibn Rushd did this work before Freud did, and you know do we know that Freud did not read Ibn Rushd because he was translated? So you know I mean we need to, that's what I mean by we need to rethink and change our approaches to things. We always need to rethink, but I'd just like to point out that Giacometti also felt alien in Paris. And I wonder if the art historian Gaston Deal, who to my astonishment was functioning in Venezuela and then Prague and then got Moroccan artists to work on the great anti-fascist painting of 1951. Um, I, uh, I don't know if it was 1951, I've just forgotten, but the great anti-fascist painting. I, I actually think that some of these networks are a little bit more complex. Mm -hmm. Also, people uh, like to just talk about Paris and the School of Fine Art. And in fact, um, people have no conception of the fact that all the anti-fascist painters of the 1970s in Spain 
were going to Paris mm -hmm. to be free. Sure. I mean, it's not it's not just it's not just like a, a south south problem. But I wanted going back to the uncanny. I'm very glad because my favourite quotation of this morning just in. It is, it was, was the um, uncanniness of the contemporary encounter, which is actually spreading uncanniness everywhere. But I think perhaps in terms of, of, of this moment, it's rather a good idea. And with that came the quotation, I think, by Gita Kapoor. Um, and I want to just say to you all, because some of you are, have come from a long way away, please don't miss the amazing exhibition of Indian art at the Barbican, talking about metonymic relays. I think we're all involved with metonymic relays but the uh, but the the tips of all the icebergs which is not a very southern metaphor i'm sorry um are are, are inviting us always to go deeper and deeper into infrastructures and different personalities and different trajectories and surprise trajectories and personally um if you were aware of all the incredible uh, problems we have in this country, speaking as an English person, uh, with racism, with violence, with immigration, and with with other people, uh, including second and third generation people here, I would think that using constantly talking about others and saying that's where the others come from is a little bit out of it. I think a lot of discourses just really discount diasporic populations and their historicity. So anyway, thank very, you to all of very, you. Very surprising that this is the case in the UK, because, you know, in the US, we have none of that. <laughs> okay, thank you very, very much. Uh, we have a few more minutes, and uh, I'm going to uh, open it to the floor if uh, any of you would like to contribute uh, with any comment. Uh, about, yeah, of course, Ismail, yes, sure. Okay, I, I, it's interesting to hear the closing remarks, and um, I want to suggest to put on the table a, a different perspective. I think the social sciences and the humanities are in deep uh, predicament. And the question is how could we map or delimit this predicament? One major aspect of this predicament is the uh, economic side of it and the technological developments, which renders a large part of the social sciences and the humanities as uh, redundant on the, this moment. And um, there is a need for a deep analysis what type of humanities and social sciences we, including uh, history of art, including uh, other um, disciplines that deal with art. There is a, a, a serious predicament, even if you look at the budget or at the hiring or at the market. It's, so it's interesting that we, in the conference, dislocated these predicaments onto the art field and as if we are outside of it. But you say that, but in fact, the, the humanity... Just let me, let me finish, please. Threat. Let me yes. finish. So there is a serious predicament in the academia and the function of university as such. And this crisis has, you know, uh, probably, you know... It's better because you live it in the U.S. or in the U.K. on a daily basis. Um, how we are perceived by the higher administrations, by the and all this, and how this disseminates into how we perceive ourselves as uh, subjects who produce knowledge about art or other soft uh, fields. So the question is not only uh, about art. It's about us looking at the art in a certain way. Now, and then come the predicament of the power relations. And power relations and what is the ethical platform that we are talking from. I think this is crucial. I mean, I agree with Dries about plurality. But plurality as such, uh, without 
يعني making the power relations naked and without يعني how you call it this يعني dynamics that by definition excludes and includes and even kill quote and quote uh, and this is, has nothing to do even with the South as such. This is in the uh, imperial metro, you know, that you, we need to think about it. And then when you think about the other parts of the world, these issues are irrelevant. These issues are irrelevant. For the question, who is your reference? The journal that you publish or the people that you live with? For me, it's the people I live with. Like, I'm not talking about an object of study. I am the object of the study at the same time that I am talking. And because of that, I asked Hamid yesterday, what about the qawl? Mm -hmm. the utterance. What I am saying about these realities and how I am saying it. And in art, it becomes more crucial because of art carries the contradictory nature of our existence. <laughs> It's speaking what we can't say. So I think, as a closing remark, I would think that maybe we should think about uh, our practice as part of this predicament and not outside of it. Thank you. So thank you again for this great conference. And I think, am I on? Yeah, OK. Um, in, re in adding to that, I think that there are a lot of obviously problems, right? Underfunding, um, how we communicate using academic language and so on and so forth. And I think one of the things that comes out of this is that many of us entered into the academic conversation with a desire for agency. Mm -hmm. And it is the success of that academic conversation that has put it in jeopardy, that has led for it to be underfunded, marginalized, it's only academic, and so on. And so the question is, as strategic actors who are privileged by the very fact of having autonomy, having food on our tables, being able to travel and so on, how do we you know, strategize to produce agency, to produce publicly accessible speech in ways that are accessible? And in this way, I feel like we have a lot to learn from artists who also often use word ways of um, producing rhetoric that are inaccessible. What does accessibility mean? How do we create it? How do we take our knowledge, take our research skills, take our analytical skills, and not just figure out why is the world ignoring what we're producing, but how do we produce them in ways that are evocative? How do we create video games? How do we work with artists, with popular singers? How do we work with people and seek people to work with so that the knowledge we have doesn't remain abstract and closeted and sometimes what I think of as a mental institution, i.e. a university? Because you know, I think of myself as deinstitutionalized and I mean that in two ter two ways, um, <laughs> you know. And it's it's a weird space of discovering how much I have been bounded and discovering discovering an autonomy in that, but also discovering the potential of an absence of platform. And I think that as there are fewer roles at universities, it impinges on us to work together to figure out how to create media, how to create voices, how to create conversations that can engage the multiple audiences which we're trying to engage. That is, we're trying to, I think we're done with, hey, we're human too, which we've been doing you know, for decades in the West, but we still have that voice. We also have the audiences which are you know, as racist, as provincial, as um, local, that we have in the countries that we're from. We're in a very particular position of privilege and silencing, and what do we do with that? And I'll finish my remarks with one question, which is we've got to do this again. Yeah. <laughs> That's it, so thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Sure.
One last remark. <laughs> thank you, and I'm honored to hear that, actually. Well, uh, just to say, obviously, thank you very much for all the concepts, for all the presentations, and all the ideas that has actually been born. Uh, but uh, I'm glad that we sort of ended on a slightly different note, as far as I could understand, about the urgencies that we have today. I mean, overall, during the past two days, one saw a lot of the paths that artists have taken, and yet I felt that the word decolonization needs to be now explored in the concept of recolonization, because that is exactly what is happening. Perhaps uh, since uh, the last great war, uh, the progresses that we've made on many fronts, we have probably lost that within the last one year. Uh, and, and it appears sometimes that uh, we have a huge challenge ahead of us in order to turn the wheel back uh, it's not the death of humanity as, uh, in terms of numbers or human numbers. It's the death of humanity in terms of our collective consciousness of what we are witnessing. So um, it's not to end this on a gloomy note. I think uh, the most important one is, uh, I'm not too good at it, but the words of Dylan Thomas, who said that, do not go gentle into the good night, but rage, rage against the dying of the light. So let us remember that. Thank you very much once again. Uh, I also need to thank all the speakers, chairs, and all of you, of course, uh, for this incredible, I mean, making uh, this conference very incredible. And I also need to thank again, once again, who, I mean, uh, helped ruin the conference, Fatima, of course, Cathy, who just left, Audra, Zainab, Allah, and Zara, and of course, above all, Mohammed, uh, who have been doing <laughs> behind the scene. And so, thank you all very much. Thank you. Thank you.